My name is Mitch Lacey. Technical interviewing. You're doing it wrong. What you're about to see is a presentation given by myself and a friend of mine, Jonathan Wownagle. This was done at Microsoft back in 2013 at a conference called the ALM Summit. In this, in this talk, we presented a bunch of dysfunctional interviewing patterns for technical people, and then some solutions on how to do it well. I've outlined this in my book as well, the Scrum Field Guide. So please give it a watch. Hit that like, hit that subscribe button, and uh, any comments, please throw in, and let's get the discussion started. Enjoy the video. Okay. And look at that. We just happened to time it perfectly that at 11.02, the song ends. Anybody know that band? No, didn't ring a bell? Death Cab for Cutie, Death Cab for Cutie local band. There you go. Awesome. Um, technical interviewing, you're doing it wrong. In fact, in fact, well, well, yeah, they're doing it wrong, not us, because we're well, good. Someone's doing it wrong. Someone's doing it wrong. So we're going to talk about technical interviewing, doing it wrong, um, and uh, let's dive in, shall we? Logistics. The one thing we need to tell you is that lunch is after this. Uh, there are 400 people approximately at this conference, which means that when you're done, you're going to be standing in line for 20 minutes, and you only get 45 minutes for lunch. So, being the nice gentleman that we are, we have decided that we will release you slightly early so that you may fill your bellies. <laughs> All right. You're up. So I'll, I'll introduce Mitch for him. Mitch is author of the Scrum Field Guide. It's a good book about Agile, about Scrum. You should pick it up, take a look. He's got 15 years of project management experience, and he's got his full belt of Agile merit badges. He's been a Scrum Alliance Board member, Agile Alliance Board member, certified Scrum Master. And he's got a blog and a, a Twitter address you can check out. And this is my buddy Jonathan. Jonathan's a dev lead over in CodePlex. Anyone know what CodePlex is? A little, little, little shout out for CodePlex. Yay! It's ranked number two to who? GitHub. <laughs> GitHub. It's ranked number two to GitHub. And then it was ranked number two to who before that? Google Code. Google Code. OK. The good thing here is, is that it's constantly ranked number two. Woohoo! Because if you're number one, you're a target. And if you're number three, you're a loser. So. Number two is where you want to be. There you go. There you go. Um, Jonathan's been doing this crazy agile stuff for a long time. When I worked here at Microsoft, we used to banter back and forth on aliases and have, have good times together. So this is actually the first time we've had the opportunity to present and do some fun stuff together. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, we both conducted lots of interviews. And that is what you are here to learn. You are here to learn about technical interviewing. Ways to do it differently, not necessarily better or the same thing, but different. So we're going to talk about reasons to change. We're going to talk about ways to set up and create a good interview experience, both for you as the interviewer, but also for the interviewee. And then there's common interviewing mistakes. I don't know about you, but I've come up with some crazy games. I actually gave Jonathan a, a puzzle, a puzzle, and I'll tell you the uh, I'll tell you the pattern. I, well, Jonathan will tell you the pattern I was exhibiting, but I. I showed him a puzzle, and he's looking at it going, I have no idea how to do this. And I said, it's easy. Say it out loud. He said it out loud. I still don't get it. I'm like, well, you just failed the interview. And I actually did that a few times. It was fun. And then, and then we're going to wrap each little pattern up with some modern interviewing techniques. So why on earth would you want to change your interview process? Give me one reason for you guys. Yeah, OK, well, for all the crap that says on the screen. <laughs> Blah, 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 things and stuff, right? Um, one of the things that you're going to hear us talk about is a forecast. A forecast, and, and that, what that is, it's the ability for you to increase your confidence in what you think the candidate will be good at or bad at inside your company. Because at the end of the day, that's what you really want. We do an interview. We come up with an assessment. What's our forecast? How long will it take for them to get up and running? How long will it take for them to adapt? How well are they going to fit the culture? Stuff like that. Because what we're trying to do is minimize the cost from bad hires. We've all made bad hiring decisions. I have made bad hiring decisions. right? And the, the cost to be able to get rid of that person is astronomical. Not only is that person poisoning the well, but you have all these other people inside the company, inside the group, inside the team that are saying, look, if this guy doesn't go, I'm out of here. And that sucks. That's a big problem for management and leadership. Best way to solve it, don't have the problem. 
That gets to number three, ensuring a good cultural fit. And lastly, you have to make sure that you're having a good impression on your candidates because people are going to come through, and we're going to show you these patterns here. People are going to come through, and they're going to sit there, and they're going to say, seriously? Are you kidding? No, dude, really? Are you kidding? And you're going to go, no, this is a real interview. And that person's going to go, oh, these guys are tools. They don't know anything. So these are actually a lot of fun. Jonathan, walk us through the interviewing fundamentals. Uh, so, so there's a few fundamental things to think about in interviewing that, that we'll be referring to in the rest of the presentation. One, if you talk to all the top recruiters in the world, they all agree there's only three fundamental interviewing questions. Can they do the job? Will they be motivated? And would they get along with coworkers? So really think about all the questions you ask, everything you do in interviews, they're really fundamentally trying to answer one of these three questions. And so everything you do relates to this in some way. And, and I, I want to stress the importance of both creating an accurate forecast. And again, by forecast, we mean not trying to judge by a bar, but trying to imagine what would happen if this person joined your company. Six months, what it would look like. Twelve months, what it would look like. So it's, it's predicting the future of what this person's results would be at the company. And the positive interviewing experience. This is something people do not think about enough. Really making sure that interviewing with you, with your company, is a good experience for the candidate. And so the presentation, we've structured into a set of hiring anti-patterns. And we probably spent more time on this presentation coming up with funny names for these anti-patterns than anything else. So I hope you appreciate the names. But the names are the Riddler, the Disorienter, the Stone Tablet, the Nuth Fanatic, the Cram Session, Groundhog Day, Gladiator, and Hear No Evil. <laughs> the Riddler. Uh, any, any, anybody had the why are, manholes cover, why are manhole covers round question? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's the Riddler. These questions are designed to see how you think. Okay, to see how you think. Why are manhole covers round? Who gives a crap why they're round? <laughs> they're round because some smart guy somewhere decided to make them round and not square so that they probably wouldn't fall in the hole. And I don't care why. I don't care the logic. I don't care about the, the, the weight balance distribution of the steel. I just don't care. But that's the Riddler. Okay? The problem here is that the questions are way too abstract. Way too abstract. And they're removed from what it is you're actually doing. As, a, as an interviewee, I, I had, this, um, I had a, a similar question to this. I never got this one uh, at a large software company in the Pacific Northwest 10, 15 years ago when I was interviewing for a job at, uh, at, at the company, the large software company. And, um, and I think I said to the guy, right there, are you serious? Yeah, I need you to solve this for me. OK, well, uh, hmm. Uh, dude, I don't know. <laughs> was, well, you need to answer it. And I said, no problem. Can you tell me how it's applicable to the job? Uh, well, uh, uh, there's other people that ask these questions, so I'm going to ask them too, which leads us to another pattern that we're going to talk about later. How many of you have come, how many of you exhibit this pattern? How many of you have done it? Come on, I've done it. Two people, three people have courage. Everyone else is awesome, OK. <laughs> All right, everyone else is awesome. So this takes us actually into the disorienter. <laughs> the disorienter. Whenever I hear this, I think of Futurama. I love Futurama. Right? This one is similar, OK, similar to the Riddler, but this one is very large abstract questions. These are programming questions with low job correlation. right? Uh, I was talking with my buddy Brad Wilson last night. In fact, Matthew's in the room somewhere, and so is Jim. Oh, there you guys are. And Brad said, one of my favorite questions is, is to have people parse Roman numerals from this and that and the other thing. And, and I look over and I go, ah, you're the disorienter. And he, uh, he made some snarky comment that I won't repeat. But this is, where, this is where, as an interviewer, you sit down and you say to the person, write me a Sudoku game. And your response is, Oh, I thought I was here to do COBOL programming, right? Like go back 10 years or whatever. Yeah, but Sudoku's cool and it's the new thing. OK, but there's no correlation. Yeah, but we want to see how you think. We want to see how you could solve that problem. I want to look at your skills. Eh. Can they write games? Does it matter if they can write games? No, it doesn't. 
So why would you ask them questions around, can you build a game for me? If you're building a web service, you should probably ask them questions around web services. If you're building databases, maybe you ask them questions around databases. That might be a little more obvious. Okay? Now think about this from the customer standpoint or the client or your, your interviewee experience. They're going to sit there and they're going to say, so wait a minute here. You want me to go build you a game. It has absolutely nothing to do with the job at hand. How am I supposed to show you my skills? How am I supposed to show you what I'm capable of? Because on my resume, it doesn't say I'm great at building games. It says I'm good at these other things. Yet you're asking me these crazy questions. So what you need to do is come up with scenarios that relate more to the job. Now, a lot of you are probably going to say, well, duh, that's common sense. Oddly enough, we often don't do it. Scenarios that relate to the job. Hmm. Maybe you throw the person in with the team. Maybe you create an immersive experience. Maybe you actually ask them questions around what they'll be doing from a day-to-day -day basis. If they're going to be cleaning toilets, have them demonstrate how they clean toilets. If they're going to be building databases, ask them about stored procedures and crazy fun stuff. Okay? But this, this is... This is, these, these two tie together, and I think you're going to really like the next one, which is the stone tablet, because it ties in even more. The, the stone tablet is one of my favorite ones. And one of the things about these, these anti patterns is I, I don't know where they started. I don't know why people repeat them. But I think about this one. It's, it's using a whiteboard for programming testing. I, I, I imagine this must have started in the mainframe era, when it wasn't realistic to have someone write code on the actual machine. Uh, but if you ask interviewers, nobody I know has ever enjoyed whiteboard programming. And, and it's such an unnatural experience, it doesn't really do the best job in giving you insights into their programming skills. Let's, let's ask a question. How many of you interview people, when, when you're interviewing developers, you use a whiteboard? Raise your hand. Come on, come on, be honest, be honest, thank you. There's the rest of you. Okay, mm -hmm. so at least half. How many of you write code on the whiteboard on a daily basis? One person, daily basis. So that's your IDE? <laughs> I just want to make sure. He's got Because <laughs> that'd be awesome. So, so what this does from a candidate experience perspective is they, they, they always feel like it's an inadequate means of demonstrating themselves. It feels unnatural. They don't feel like they really have shown you. And, and you know, they have to wonder. I mean, if they're interviewing for a high-tech company, this feels like a low-tech interviewing experience. And so again, maybe these, as we say it, seem obvious, but we just saw how many people follow this pattern. So I think you should think about it. Have them use a computer with a keyboard. I mean, Notepad, just pulling up Notepad. They, they look is, like these. Is, is a better option than a whiteboard. But I mean, pull, pull up an IDE. I mean, all of my interviews, when I have some program, I mean, it's just a text editor. I put, I put them in front of an IDE. I, I think you can even go further with this. Like, you can do pair programming sessions. I mean, this, a pair programming session will give you insights not just into their, pro, their programming skills, but it can also give you insights into their collaboration and some cultural characteristics. So, I mean, you can make your, your interview more efficient and get more information out of it. Uh, the Nuth Fanatic. This, this <laughs> is another very, very popular one. So, so the Nuth Fanatic is the interviewer who believes the only meaningful question to ever ask a candidate comes out of the Algorithm and Data Structures book. If you don't know Donald Newth, he creates a great Algorithm and Data Structures book. Um, and the, the problem with this pattern is, the people that, that think this is the only way to interview a candidate, is that modern software development is so much more than algorithms and data structures. If you focus so narrowly on just algorithm and data structures, you are really not creating a good forecast of what's going to happen six months down the road when this candidate is working at your company. And, and I, this is probably the number one candidate experience complaint I hear. Like, I, I talk to a lot of people about negative experiences. Spending the whole time doing random algorithm questions is, gets complained about a lot. And, and people think, you know, I've got two, five, ten years of experience. I mean, these questions seem like they could ask a, a fresh college graduate. I mean, how are they interviewing me as an experienced developer differently than anyone else? And, and do they really care about that? I mean, what, is this really what is important to them? So, so here's, here's what I suggest instead. Really think about the list of skills to evaluate. I mean, algorithm data structures can be one. That's fine. 
but come up with a list of topics that are relevant to your job. Divide the topics among the interviewers. Each interviewer should be able to do two or three topics and give you kind of a grade and assessment and judge the candidate based upon that overall spectrum of relevant things. And here's, here's just some examples that you could brainstorm that I often include. Uh, check their unit testing, check their database skills, check their agile processes understanding. Open source, have they heard of it? <laughs> I mean, these, these are things that I check in addition, as are topics I often give to people on interview loops around. And, and, and try to take an immersive approach. Simulate working with the pro person. That, that is, can, is, does a good job of giving you more insights as well as uh, creating a positive interview and experience. Do you want to talk cram session? Yeah. Let's talk cram session. Um, how many of you have kids in school? Did you just block the screen? I did. Can you bring it back? Yeah, I can. I can press the button and magic happens. Okay. See? All right. On, on, that was on. intentional. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. I thought you accidentally <laughs> hit the, the black screen button. No, 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 no. I, I, I pressed the button. <laughs> so we have people in school. <laughs> theatrics we, we didn't practice. You theatrics, <laughs> theatrics in practice, yes. Yeah, when we did our dry run, we didn't have the button. So now we have the button. So All I right. get to confuse Jonathan. Um, <laughs> cram session. You get, some of you have kids in school. I have kids in school. Uh, my oldest daughter, Ashley, just did uh, finals, I think it was last week. Anybody have finals recently? What, did, what was the behavior of the kid, of your child? Freaking out over memorization. Freaking out over memorization. Exactly. That's exactly what this one is. Which is, if I go off and I study all this stuff and I sit down and I answer the right question, then I get the job. When I interviewed here, I'm sorry, a large software company, I sat down with a friend of mine. Microsoft interviewed a lot of these patterns, uh, yes. invented a lot of these patterns. Yeah. So I sit down with a friend of mine and I say, I'm really nervous, similar to our teenagers. I am really nervous about the interview. What should I study? What should I know? What answers are they looking for? Oh, well, what they're looking for is this. If you can answer this and this and this and this, you'll probably get the job. So I said, well, I don't, but two of those things I don't know. Oh, it's okay. Just here. What was the word you used again? Freaking out. No, after that. <laughs> Memorize. Memorize this script. And if this question comes up, give this answer. Anyone done that before? Never studied for an interview before? All right, okay. And give this answer. So I did this. I did this. I gave the answer. The guy asked me a question on, you know, some soap call something or other. And so, of course, I had to go up to the, where did I go in the room? We're in an office. The whiteboard, because he's a stone tablet interviewer. So I go up to the whiteboard and I write some things down. Oh, that's an interesting approach. Why that approach? And found it. Blah. I spew out the information that he's looking for and he says, I like your style. <laughs> Why, thank you, sir. May I have another? Sure. And I got the job. Was I qualified? Eh, mostly. <laughs> right? But was I able to pass the test? Absolutely. And that's all that mattered. I, I went back from the college experience, and I said, all right, cram, 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 cram. What do I need to do? And off I went and did it. Studying for an interview, if you spend a week studying for an interview, you're probably going to get the wrong person in your company. You're going to get a person who's good at answering the questions you want to hear, not who's good with a cultural fit or meets the skills that you're actually looking for. Because all they're doing is passing a test, which is going to take us into a couple other patterns here that we're going to show you. But really, going back to what Jonathan said, with the new fanatic, Right? Here I have all this experience, but you're asking me these basic rudimentary questions that probably haven't changed over time that anybody can answer. And if I wanted to go pull it up on the, pull it up on the interwebs, I could find the answer. What was the one we talked about last night, Jim? How do you write a unit test for Hello World? And your answer was, I don't, I don't know. I don't know and I don't care. That's what, that's what search engines are for. Right? So in this case, in this case, you, you want to create immersive experience that allows you, the interviewer, and the team that hopefully you're interviewing with, because Jonathan said, said this on the last one, 
we want to create an immersive experience. An immersive experience is one that actually represents what the candidate will be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, meaning instead of coming in and cramming, it's you're just going to sit down and be yourself. Explain who you are, show what you're capable of doing, which means your questions are going to be different because what you're looking for are skills and competencies. Does that make sense? The stone tablet one I love. Hopefully no one will do the stone tablet anymore after this. One of my favorite movies of all time. Anyone else like Groundhog Day? Bill Murray? Yeah. Day two was awesome. Yay, I get to do all the cool stuff I didn't do yesterday. Day 365 was terrible. Okay? And this was similar to what we were just talking about. I'm going to ask you the same questions over and over and over and over again. How many of you, and be honest with me, how many of you are using the same interview questions today that you were using five and ten years ago? Thank you. Now, you may say to yourself, they're great questions, and I like them. Or you may say to yourself, eh, maybe they suck and I don't know. But what this is, is it gives you false positives and negatives because you're asking, you have this book of questions, and you're asking these candidates a script. And the script may or may not fit what it is you're looking for. It may, may or may not fit the job role, the job title. It may not even fit the culture of the company anymore because the cultures emerge, cultures change. So as a result, you're going to get these indicators that may tell you, oh, the candidate's great. And you find out six months later that they're not great. You just asked the wrong question. Because remember, in a forecast, like Jonathan said, what we're trying to do is determine if this person's going to be a good fit in three months, six months, nine months down the road, both from a skill and a competency standpoint, right? The candidate experience could be this, and I've had this happen to me several times, where I get asked questions, but they're, they're, they're not outside my comfort zone. They're just right on the borderline of my skill set because the candidate, the, the interviewer is asking me from a script, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, the questions you're asking me don't have any relationship. If you were asking me question, questions related to the job, I'd be nailing them. But instead, you're asking me how to parse Roman numerals, and I don't care because that's why I have a search engine. Right? So there's a way around this. Very similar to the cram session, right? The last bullet. Good thing I asked my buddy what they asked beforehand, so I got the job anyway. <laughs> How many times have you guys found yourself in the situation where you ask the same questions, you get a person in the company, and you go, well, bad fit, we screwed up? Thank you. One person. So everybody is awesome at hiring. Dude, well, think, that's why they came here. I think they need to come up here. They right. need to go sit over there. I'll get that turn. All right. Let's talk about um, the gladiator. Uh, this, is, this is a fun one. Y you know those companies that take pride in how tough their interviews are? No, we, we, we only accept the best and the brightest. So we need to make our interviews really, really difficult so only the best and the brightest can pass it. So they, they do this by, by creating not, not an interview, but it's, it's, a, it's like an, a, a, an episode of American Gladiator. It's like a gauntlet of challenges. You know, we're going to hit you with the toughest questions, the hardest questions, and see if you can survive this battle. Yeah, and you have to face Gandalf at the end. <laughs> the... Um, the problem with this... Huh? The gray or the white? Uh, the gray. <laughs> the gray is far cooler. The, the, the problem with this approach is, is when you create an adversarial interview in a context, you know, it, it also creates a lot of stress on it. And, and this affects the candidate in ways. I mean, it affects the candidate's focus. It affects the candidate's ability to really work through these sessions. And... and and hopefully, you know, severe stress management is not an adversarial, dealing with adversarial situations is not core requirement for working at your company. It's not one of the most important things. And, and, and the candidate experience really couldn't be worse. I mean, they go through and they felt like they just talked to a bunch of the most egotistical set of people that they've ever interviewed with. And all this toughness, prove yourself to me kind of approach 
why they didn't enjoy the experience, why would they enjoy working at the company? They don't want to be they don't want to come back. It feels like it feels like a traumatic episode. So the 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 alternative techniques that you can use instead, don't make the interview a challenge. Don't create this adversarial environment. Make it an exploratory conversation. Make it about learning about each other, figuring out what they know, not, not challenging them, just, just discovery. Discovery. Um, and, and this will create a much better context, and it's also going to help you understand. It's like mapping, getting a map of what the candidate know to, knows and what the candidate is capable of. And, and that gives you a better sense of the candidate, and it's a much, much better interviewing experience. Did I just turn off your clicker? No. No. OK. Uh, so hear no evil. This, if, if there's any pattern I would suggest you think about, if there's any pattern I suggest you change, this is the one that I suggest. Hear no evil is never seeking feedback. Now, for me, this is something I changed a few years ago. I said, you know, I wonder if I, I you know, I look at other people's interviewing technique and say, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's very good, but I think I'm, mine's pretty good. But, uh, you know, how did I know? I, I, I was just fairly confident in my interviewing skills. I decided to start asking candidates, like people we'd hire. I started off with people I'd hire, and I'd say, you know, by the way, you know, in the, in the interviews, who, how would you rate the candidates? What are some of the comments you'd make about the interviewing experience? What were some of the things you thought made you believe the candidate was a, the, the interviewer was a better or worse interviewer? I, that was really what changed how I thought think about this, maybe more passionate about this topic of, of good interviewing techniques. It's also how I discovered, really discovered all these anti-patterns, because they started showing up in this feedback. And so, it, you know, for people who never s seek feedback from candidates, you know, some of the problems you get is your forecasting doesn't improve. You mean your, your candidate experience, maybe it's good, it's, maybe it's painful. You know, if, if you're not getting the feedback, I guarantee you there's things you're doing wrong, there's things other people on your interviewing days are doing wrong that you're probably not realizing, you're probably not thinking about. So if nothing else, please think about this one. And I'll give an example. I think I broke your clicker. No, you're there. So I'll give some, so fundamentally I just changed. I started getting feedback from people. I mean, I, I recommend, if you're not, if, if you haven't done this, you haven't thought of this, Send post-interview surveys to all of the candidates that come through. Ask them for some ratings on the interviewers they talk to. About how, ask them how, how good do they think each interviewer was in terms of the quality of the interview and the quality of the interview experience. I mean, those are the two questions I would suggest you ask them. And, and general feedback about the interview session I, I think you will be surprised. And as I said, these, these, these anti-patterns largely discovered out of this feedback. And I, I mentioned a couple of times what, you will hear, what people tend to complain about most. And this is how I discovered them. And, and what do you do with this feedback? You then use it. Collect the tips of the top-rated interviews. Discover what they're doing differently. Share it. Discover which one of the lower-ranked interviewers. Figure out what they're doing wrong. Share some of the top tips with them. Let them know, by the way, there's something that you're doing in your interviews that's creating a bad experience or is not impressing the candidates. So I, I, again, of all the patterns, this is the one I most recommend yeah. that you think about, that you do something about. Um, do you want to go to the next one? How uh, you want to do it? I do. Okay, I do go for it. That. Go for it. All right, yeah. so let's have a little bit of fun. This is, a, this is an interview question that I used to give candidates when I worked at large software company in Pacific Northwest. And if you, if you know the answer, don't blurt it out. I want to see if people can solve it. What you're going to do is you're going to solve for the, for the there, were, there are four lines on the screen. And what you need to do is solve the fifth. I had one candidate who took an hour. And he didn't say he was, he didn't give up. He said, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. The hour ended and he said, crap, I don't know. And I said, OK, well, it's this. And he goes, oh, I was going to put that. <laughs> Who's seen this one before? Anyone seen it before? 
Okay? I actually have this on my blog from like five years ago. Who knows it? What is it? One three two one one zero. How many of you think that's right or wrong? Six one one zero. Okay. Five three one. No, I got. I spent ten minutes. If you should, I spent ten minutes looking at it. I was sure I could figure it out, and then he told me the trick. I was pissed off. <laughs> Bad experience. Yeah. So, so I, I will say this: there, I did hear a right answer. Let me just let let me walk you through it. Everybody, simultaneously, read the first row to me. Zero. zero. Read row number two. One zero. one zero. Read row number three. One 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 zero. Read row number four. Three one one zero, and row number five. One three, two one, one zero. <laughs> I am a dick. <laughs> that is a messed up interview question, right? And to let some poor guy sit there and stew for an hour, right? Here we are, right here. The disorienter and the Riddler. What other one was I exhibiting? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Groundhog Day. Probably hear no evil in that one as well. And, and, and absolutely. <laughs> People would say to me, oh, that's a messed up interview question. I said, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's not for the benefit of the interviewee. <laughs> it is not for the benefit of the interviewee. So if you ever want to mess with somebody, I mean, really mess with them, throw this up on the whiteboard and say, solve it, and go back to your email. Understand that you're being a jerk. So, um, lastly, when we talk, what we want here is you want a good outcome, right? Your, your goal here is to have a strong company that's able to adapt to change as it emerges in the marketplace. You want to have a good, rich culture, one that values learning. Jonathan, you heard him say that in the in the, in the last one there, in the last pattern that we had. You want, you want your ability, your confidence to be able to be very high when you give that person the job, which means you could go about it two ways. You can ask people a bunch of questions inside of a closed room or an office, right? Or you could throw them into the shark tank and see what happens. If you are an agile team or any team, Create an immersive experience. Have the candidate spend a day with the team. Have them do planning. Have them do coding. Have them do testing. Have them do documentation. Because the best way to assess the skills and the competencies, and I will say the competencies are more important sometimes or most of the times than the skills, the best way to do that is to by sit, sitting down and doing it together. Jim and I had this discussion last night. Jim. Jim teaches a, a class over at the University of Washington, an Agile certification program. The discussion, one of the points last night was, in order for you to build a strong team, you have the mic, you said. I don't know what, I don't remember what you, you were, were talking about. about building, you were talking about team building, and we were talking about distributed. How, what's, how, do you, how do you build teams? How do you get, what do you need? So uh, team building is about building the way I, and I didn't say it well last night because I thought about it afterwards. Uh, software is a human endeavor, okay? And the way that humans work together is they build relationships and they understand strengths, weaknesses, pros, cons, who's good at what, who's not good at what, and they all figure it out as a team. Uh, if you think about in terms of distributing that team, you still have to build those personal relationships and you can't build them over instant messenger or the phone, or whatever. So they have to be built together. Uh, so when I, I've run distributed teams in India, China, uh, wherever, and uh, the way I do it is I move people around. So people go and spend significant amount, um, amounts of time in the other locations because they have to build personal relationships. Now think about that in terms of interviewing. You could think about 
I'm going to go see person A, person B, person C. That is a distributed team. What you really want is the relationship, the personal, the, the personal touch, my strengths, my weaknesses. That's where the immersion comes in. That's where the understanding the competencies come in. That's where throwing them into the pool comes in and say, I'm working on this API. Hey, Jonathan, you're the candidate. Um, what are your skills? Oh, I'm good at this. Oh, cool, dude, I'm doing some of that. Here, have a go. Inter interview on. And Jonathan says, well, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know how to do that. Okay, what did I just learn as an interviewee? I learned that now this person is an adult, right? They have the ability to say what they know and don't know. Is that a value that we want in our team? Yeah, oh, oh, you don't know? Oh, dude, well, here, let me, let me explain it a little bit. And then he says, oh, have you thought about that? I didn't think about that. That's a cool, idea. let's, here, implement that. Now I'm learning something. Is that a value that I want? Yeah, and is he demonstrating the skills? Yeah. Am I going to get that by asking questions in a confined room and having people do stuff on a whiteboard and asking the same questions over and over again and never asking for feedback? No. If, if you want to keep your promise of giving them a few minutes before I lunch, do. I do. probably got questions. All right. And the, and the first, actually, the first question is the reverse one. Mitch, Mitch has brought a copy of his book. And so we'll, we'll ask three people get to share their top negative interviewing experience. I'm willing to bet. It's a reflection of one of these anti-patterns. And whoever has, of the three people, whoever has the best story, Mitch will award him a book. So, so raise your hand if you want to. I'll even sign it and make it out to eBay user. Do, do, do we have to do a review of it? Do it? No. OK, good. <laughs> OK, good. So raise your hand if you want to share a story. This is a pretty old story, but uh, it still stands out today. This is back when assembly language programming was common, and it was on an old machine. Sat down in an interview one time, and someone asked me to list all of the opcodes for the processor along with their octal equivalents. And since I'm saying octal rather than hex, you can tell how long ago it was. It was actually kind of fun. I berated the guy for about 10 minutes, told him why it was the stupidest question ever asked, and then gave him the list in alphabetical order and numerical order. I got a call back from one of the HR people said, uh, we're not hiring you because you seem to know too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I th we have a leader so far. Okay, who's got, who's so, got another story? Right, that's, a, that's, a, that's a groundhog day for me. I'll be right there. Get to work out. Come on, Jim. Hustle, hustle. Get your, get your Nike fuel up. That's right. I'll, I'll have more fuel now. More fuel. So I used to work at a company, and I can't really say the company, but its initials are GE. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we were required after we interviewed everybody to provide specific quantitative feedback on why we hired one person versus another. So we had, and we were required to ask the same questions to every interviewee candidate so that we could score them on a one to 10 basis and then provide them sort of a numerical ranking on who we hired and who we didn't hire based off those numbers. So, so a company policy, yeah. a Groundhog Day company policy. So my favorite quote about uh, a company with the last the letters of GE is GE are the last two letters in garbage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number three. We gotta we gotta pick here. I remember being interviewed for a position of Java developer in a company which starts and that ends with S. Uh, and I remember that uh, I was interviewed by the people who had no idea about Java at all. So what they had, they had a piece of paper of the questions and the answers. The problem was that somebody, while I was typing it into into a computer to print it out, they messed up the questions and the answers. <laughs> so that is awesome. The answer awesome. for question one was under the question two, and so on and so forth. So did you fail miserably? No, uh, because, you know, uh, at that time, I was able to see on a long distance, having problem with the reading something was really close, so I could see that and actually pointed it out. <laughs> they have thrown me out of the interview. <laughs> That's a pretty good story. Oh, which one do you like? <clears throat> Next, uh, I could give you, I, my favorite one is uh, I've been given the Wonderlick exam in an, ex in an interview, uh, as well as a logic test. Uh, ah, given oh a logic test? A logic test and the Wonderlick were the entry into the interviews. 
<laughs> it I still wasn't on a billboard. Which one so, do you like? I like the last one. I also I like the first one. I like the first one too, but I think the last one's going to edge him out by a uh, ever so slightly. There you go. Thank you very much. You bet. All right, questions. We got them up on the board here. Do you want to go to the question? Well, we can go to the question. Right here. Right here. So uh, I know that you said that Microsoft is famous for a lot of these. This came out of Microsoft. Uh, are you guys actually using the modern techniques that you presented today um, within your teams? I do. My team, you know, people who interview for my team, I, I work closely with any, anybody that's going to participate on a loop for my team, on an interview loop for my team. I talk to the interviewers ahead of time. I give them coaching, and I check to see whether they're going to exhibit any of these patterns, and I talk them out of it. Jim? Oh, okay. So yes, so since Jonathan does it and he works for Microsoft, that means Microsoft does it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've used some of these immersive patterns um, for the past year or so. Um, but one thing is, obviously you don't want to spend a day with a candidate that hasn't gone through some pre-screening before that. What, what type of approach have you done to try and limit it down to a, a reasonable number of candidates. So, so, I, so I'll give you my experience and you do yours. So I, narrow, I, I do the same thing, right? So it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a filter screen of the resume, number one. But the team is also involved in that. So yeah, it's a pain in the butt if they get 5,000 resumes. Um, one of the things that I always look for is uh, what, what does the individual put on their resume besides skills, meaning what are the soft skills? What are the competencies? What are they good at? You know, I'm, I'm good at building teams. I'm good at managing conflict. I'm good at managing budgets. Those, those are a little softer skills versus, uh, you know, I can write the pants off of anybody in C++. So it's, it's still that initial screen. Training of the HR department to look for that, to look for wait, what do we as a company value? Well, we value these behaviors. If you think you see those behaviors, those traits, those competencies, then let's. Then why don't you call up that candidate, or let's bring him in. I, you know, I, I think you could do you another another session about pre-screening candidates. I mean, yeah. for me, it's the usual looking at resumes, and I've looked at the resumes a long time. Cues I look for is does the resume look like it was written as trying to include the right words in it versus was the resume written to try to express who they are. Yeah. I, I like the resumes that are better about trying to express who they are versus including a list that they think you'll like. Um, phone screens, I, I do phone screens. I talk to the candidate, you know, getting a sense of, I ask them questions that do exploration, try to get a sense about them. I, I, you know, I, I think those are going to get, you're still going to have people come in and fail interviews, but you can reasonably determine whether someone has a shot that way. And additionally, and I, 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 don't have any, I, I don't have any data yet because we're not done running the experiments, but uh, video. So when you submit, submit a two-minute video. Hmm. No more than two minutes about whatever you want. Right? So, when I, so some of the ones that strike me as good, the ones that I like, are the ones that say, here's who I am, here's what I like, here are my values, right? here's the type of environment I want to work in. And I, ha and I have these skills. The ones I don't like are the ones that say, here's who I am. Here's a sample of my code on how I solved a problem. That doesn't tell me anything about you other than you know how to record a screen. Right. I, I, I want the personal touch. I want a good cultural a fit. What is your thought on the bar raiser? Is the bar raiser always a gladiator, or can it be used responsibly? <laughs> I have a problem with the concept of a bar raiser. We, and, we, we talked about this one. <laughs> because let, let's assume the market is perfect in terms of you know, market dynamics. People, the best developers have the highest salary requirements. Then saying you have a bar raising requirement, basically you should say, we only hire people that deserve 300000 a year. That's how you're going to get the best candidates. And so I, to me, it's like the whole concept of bar raiser confuses me because it's like, fine, I can show you all the best developers. They, they cost a lot. And so what do you really mean? Well, I do, do not hire any college candidates, for example. 
because a three hundred thousand dollar developer probably has some more skills and capabilities than culture. So I, I think that's why I get rid of the idea of bar raiser, introduce the idea of forecasting. What will ha what what imagine what it's gonna be like six, twelve, eighteen months from now if this person is there. Generally, is this gonna be a good result or not for the context, for the situation? Yeah, you want to hire good people, but bar raiser doesn't make sense to me. And, and I'll, I'll give you a short one. Raising the bar is fine as long as you understand what bar you're raising because there is not a single one, right? Maybe, it, maybe you're not raising the bar in terms of skill. Maybe it's we want to raise the bar in terms of having a more dynamic learning organization. Fine. Is the candidate willing to learn? Yes. Do they have any skills? No. Can we teach them the skills? Yes. Can we teach them how to learn? No. Right? It's, easy to learn, it's much easier to learn C-sharp than it is to learn how to give constructive feedback or how to take criticism. Back to Jim. Uh, I heard you mention um, the interview loop a second ago. How do you feel about, and I assume there's a process there, meaning one, one after another, uh, how do you feel about the panel or group interview, which maybe could be gladiator session, maybe not, but what's your just general thought on it? I haven't experimented a lot with it. Do you, do you have a comment? So, I, yeah, I do have a comment. I have lots of comments. Go for um, it. So I love it. I hate the single one-person interview, and you go person, 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 because you don't get an accurate representation. All you're getting is how well are they able to answer my questions. When you think about the group interview, it's not like a, a gladiator group session where you get five people inside of a conference room and the per poor person is sitting at the end of the table dodging bullets. It's... I'm working in the team space, and I'm actually, you know, I'm going to go pair with Jonathan for a couple hours, and then we're going to go get lunch. And then I'm going to go pair with Matthew for a couple hours, and then we're going to go get a coffee. Then I'm going to go pair with Jim for a couple hours. And while I'm pairing with Matthew, Jonathan's writing notes up on me. Okay? And then I go pair with Jim. Now Matthew and Jonathan are talking. Oh, what would you guys think? What would you guys think? And then I go home at the end of the day, and the team gets together and says, what did we think? Here's what we were looking for. How do we felt the person did? But it's not, a, it's not an adversarial. It's not a us asking you questions. It's a you hanging out with us for the day. And that's a totally different dynamic. You're, you're in the game versus, I'm, you know, I'm, I am qualified, coach. Please put me in. So, and there was one over. Yeah. My question was similar in the, the group interviews. It, who should be interviewing? Is it someone of a like trade? Obviously, the person who had the Java, there wasn't anybody that could have interviewed him on Java or they wouldn't have used the script. But does it have to be a manager who may or may not know the technical skills? Or does it need to be a like developer? If it's a business analyst, does it need to be a business analyst or the entire team? Who should be doing this interview? I think the person that the people who are the best technical interviewers are the best people to be doing the interviews. And I've seen managers who are total crap interviewers, and I've seen relatively you know, inexperienced people who really seem to naturally get this stuff. I mean, maybe it's because they haven't learned all the anti-patterns that people repeat. I, I think look for, I mean, look for interviewing skill more than that. Now, of course, I think they have to have some basis for, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask a technical writer to assess someone's database development skills. So, there has to be some context there, but, but capability, quality of technical interview skills matters a lot to me. And also understand, I mean, the, the title of our talk is technical interviewing. So if you take that out and you say, well, it's not technical interviewing, it's interviewing in general, then it becomes the point of, you know, who's, who's best to determine if the person's a good team player? Who's best to determine if they have courage? Right? Maybe, maybe we want courage on our team more than we want the technical skill. So it could be that the manager is bad at determining if somebody has courage, but the janitor is good. So one, maybe two yeah, more one, questions. Let's go one, people. one more. Okay. Yeah, so you started to touch on some questions I would have. Not all of the positions that you're interviewing for are line producers necessarily. Um, yep. Also, that uh, you are reinforcing with your hiring cultural uh, mechanisms and so on. Well, what about the hire for where you're trying to go versus where you are? I mean, you might be hiring uh, to disrupt, to actually change your culture. Um, you might be hiring for, I mean, 
you're looking now for courage. You're looking for things that, that are not maybe the commodity technical skills. Right. And at the same time, you might n need those skills or at least think you need those skills but, because sure enough, if we're interviewing technical leaders, yes. we're asking about that stuff too. Um, and let's see, I, I had a bunch of them, but that's probably enough. I, I remember on one of the slides, we, we put hire for a desired culture, and the desired word is very important there, because your existing culture may not be your desired culture. Good. And so, you, you had one, I think we can, we can squeak it in. What advice would you give for... Oh, but hold on, hold on. Oh. They, oh. It has to go on the microphone so. to go on the recording. So you can ask it twice. <laughs> what advice would you give for interviewing candidates who are in remote locations, who are interviewing over Skype or video, where it becomes a little bit harder to do <laughs> pair programming, for example? Well, I, I think if you're doing remote interviewing, it, for example, it would be easier, let's just say you're doing a programming exercise, it would be easier to do a screen share of an IDE to do programming than it would be to point the camera at the whiteboard. So I'll, I'll give that example. Now, it's not to say that remote, remote interviewing, I mean, it, it can be a little bit harder, but I mean, if you're share, screen sharing an IDE, that would also make it easier to do pairing because you kind of can both interact with it. And yeah, and my, and my, my quick take on this is you're going to have to consider what you're sacrificing, right? So. Let's say we're doing a remote interview, but, and, and the person lives in San Francisco. We're here. We, we don't want to invest to bring them up. That should tell you something. Why don't you want to invest? Because it's expensive. And if we bring in 20 or 30 people, we're going to you know, spend $15,000 on flights. OK, what's the cost of bringing in a bad person? What's the cost then if we just interview based on remote and we hire someone? What's the damage that they could cause the company? Right? How much did we really save? Nothing. Right? So in the act of being cheap, we really screwed ourselves. So it, for me, the, the takeaway for that is it's important to understand what you're sacrificing. So understand why you're doing what you're doing, remote interviewing. Understand the potential sacrifice and what you may be losing, which is your ability to forecast and to have a good high degree of confidence. If you consider those and go, I'm OK with the risks, I would say, everything Jonathan said and knock yourself out. All right, I think that uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan and Mitch. Thanks.